I'm Ed from Inclusive Solutions. You probably don't know too much about us as a company. We're quite small. Uh, we have two divisions that, uh, or two sides of the business that we work on. On the one side of our business, we have, we do assistive technology for people with disabilities. Um, one of those, uh, our, our sort of our core product, would be uh, eye tracking for people with the most complex and severe disabilities. Uh, so that would be using uh, eye-controlled computers. People can look at the screen and um, type type on an on-screen keyboard, uh, control the computer, and do all the other sorts of things that normal people would do. <coughs> I should say able-bodied people should do uh, would do um, just using their eyes. Uh, and then the second side of our business is uh, eye tracking solutions for analysis and research, which is more about what we're going to be talking about today. I should start by saying that I have uh, a very limited uh, knowledge of UX research. Uh, this is my oversimplification of the work that you guys do. Um, but my understanding is that the, the, the sort of the, the core goal is to make the user experience the best it can possibly be, um, whilst at the at the same time being cognizant of, of the business needs. You know, you need your manager to be happy. Uh, you need to deliver your project on time, within budget. Uh, so, you know, you don't have free reign to do whatever the hell you want. And, and then I thought about some of the people that we work with, and, and then I thought perhaps maybe I'm doing myself a disservice to say I know nothing about this, um, because, uh, how do you design the experience for someone who can't walk, who can't move reliably, uh, who can't talk? How do you get them to uh, interact with a computer? I mean, the technology is one side of it, certainly. Um, the lady on the left there is Catherine. She's got severe athetoid cerebral palsy. Um, cognitively, she's switched on, uh, as anyone else in this room. It's just she can't control her body, and she can't she can't talk. So how do we design what, uh, what they can, you know, how do we provide them with the interface to do what, they can, what they're able to do and what they want to do? Um, and that uh, involves designing for their communication needs, for their ability to play, for their ability to learn. Um, it extends to uh, their interaction on social media, making Skype calls, SMSs, phone calls even. Even people with no voice can make a phone call if you've got the right technology. Um, and then beyond that, to the physical environment as well. So, you know, with your eyes, you can turn on a light. You can turn on a fan. You can change the channels on your TV. And it gives you that sort of independence um, that you otherwise aren't able to have. And then we also have to consider where they use this technology. So is it in bed? Is it in the wheelchair? Are they going to go to school? Are they going to go to work? Um, and um, so there's lots of things that we actually really, really have to consider when we're working with these people because their needs are so complex and so individual. And after listening to Andrew's very impressive talk this morning, I decided that maybe we've already moved ahead of UX and we are doing living services because we're having to cater for these needs uh, on such a wide on such a wide level. Because this device that they're using, it's their voice, it's their interface to the world, it's, it's their life in many ways. Anyway, back to eye tracking. <clears throat> this is uh, one area where I have a bit of experience and a bit of knowledge. So we're going to be talking about eye tracking and, sorry. And how it can be applied in UX research and how it has the power to unlock insights that actually just aren't accessible by any other, any other means. We've got a bit of a, a mixed audience here. I know some people won't have any clue what eye tracking is. Other people will have some experience and uh, other people may even be using it actively already. So uh, put simply then, it's the process of determining where someone's looking, okay? How do we do that? Well, if we just take a look at these eyes, we're gonna just go over some of the the details, let me just move around here so I can see as well. So the black part in the middle then is the pupil. The, the colored part around the outside is the iris. Okay, you all went to school, you know that. Um, and the white marks that you'll see is the reflection of light in the eye, okay? 
uh, and it's the reflection on the cornea, which is the sort of the transparent covering of the eye. So those two white marks are known as the corneal reflection. And how does the eye tracker then use this information? Um, an eye tracker has infrared illuminators in it, so it shines infrared light into the eye continually in order to create these, uh, these corneal reflections. And um, uh, infrared light is not disturbing to the user. You can look at it like you would a normal screen. You're not aware of any, anything. Um, it's not disturbing to the user. And then a special camera within the eye tracker records the relative position of the pupil to the, to, the, uh, to the corneal reflection. So that's what it's looking for. And then very complex mathematics um, will convert that recording into a position on the screen. And then that establishes where the person is looking. Now, the eye moves an awful lot. Uh, so they have to record that position a huge amount of times, many, many times. So on a base level eye tracker, you maybe do 30 data points a second, and then it'll go up from there. I mean, super high-end uh, eye trackers that you might use for, for reading studies and stuff will record 300, take, basically taking 300 photos of the eye a second so that the, you can accurately establish where the eye is looking. Now, what's interesting is, is if I maintain my gaze on one thing and I move my head, the relative position of that uh, corneal reflection to the pupil doesn't change. You'll see that the corneal reflection is still in the top of the pupil as it was there. And again, if I turn my head the other way. And now why that's important is that the eye tracker can tell that you're still looking at the same thing, you've just moved your head. Um, and why that's important from your point of view is you then have uh, your, your, your user, your respondent, has fairly free and natural head movement, which is great. You don't have to strap them into a chin rest or tie them down in any way. You know, you, you want them to be able to behave quite naturally and normally in front of, in front of your, whatever it is, your, the stimuli you're presenting to them. And now if we contrast that to eye movement, you'll see how the eye tracker differentiates. So you'll see that with the eye looking over that way, the corneal reflection is quite elongated and it's moved over. If we, move, if we look up, the corneal reflection is now inside the pupil. And over to the other side, the corneal reflection is different again. So as the eye moves, the relationship between those uh, two two points changes quite dramatically and that's how the eye tracker is able to distinguish between eye movement and head movement. Um, so it's pretty simple really, obviously apart from all the advanced mathematics that sit behind it to make it all possible. So that's how the eye tracker works, but why do our eyes move at all? Um, and you might think that's quite an obvious question, they just do. Um, you know, we have to look at stuff so our eyes move around. So if we just, um, that's true, I mean, I'm not disputing that that's what happens, uh, but there is, a, there is a, a sort of a strong reason for it. The, the human field of vision, without rotating the eyes, is 180 degrees. What we see is projected onto the retina at the back of the eye. The uh, retinal cells at the back of the eye convert that image into a signal and they send the signal to the brain. And then the brain does its thing in interpreting the image. Now obviously, there's quite a lot in that sentence, the brain does its thing, but I have to draw a line somewhere. Primarily because I don't know. <laughs> um, so of the retinal cells at the back, the area that is responsible for your high visual acuity is uh, in the center, and it's small, and it's known as the fovea. And of the 180 degrees, it only represents two degrees of your vision. And a practical example of how big that is, is it's roughly the size of your thumbnail at arm's length, okay? Um, so that's how much is in focus at any one time. If we look at this uh, shelf of products, you might imagine that that's just how we see it, right? Looks nice and shiny and everything's in focus and it looks good, right? But the reality is that we see it actually a lot more like this. 
And it's only really the foveal, foveal vision part that is in sharp focus. So that's the two degrees. If you go outside of that, the two to five degrees, which is what is known as the parafovia, is sort of getting slightly blurry. And then anything beyond five degrees is what we call our peripheral vision. And once we get into our peripheral vision, we're starting to uh, get increasing degrees of blur and loss of color. You wouldn't actually think it, would you? But your, your eyesight gets black and white the more to the edge of your... I see you looking that way just to see if you can... <laughs> you won't see it. You won't see it. Oh, oh, oh my God, it's black and white on the edge. I didn't realize. <laughs> so the, the, the more scientific answer then really is that the, the reason that we move our eyes is, is in order to bring it into direct contact with the, the foveal vision part uh, of, our, of our eyes. And it's actually a very important filtering mechanism because if all 180 degrees was in focus at one time, you'd just have total information overload. So we've established then that the eye needs to move in order to take in uh, a, a full scene. And it moves rapidly from point to point. So the way I like to think of it is um, like a high-speed shutter camera. Yeah? And it's just going... Constantly taking thousands of photos of everything. So it moves rapidly from point to point, and um, the movement's called a saccade, which, which in eye tracking uh, visualization is represented by these lines. So that would represent the movement of the eye from one point to another. Um, and your vision is actually blurred. Uh, sorry, blurred. The, the vision is mostly suppressed during a saccade to avoid blurring of vision. Okay, so uh, that movement, you don't, you're not taking anything in. It's only during the fixations when you can actually focus on something. And so the point, the point of focus are called fixations, and, and in this uh, graphic, this is shown as the, the solid colors of cir uh, circles of color. And they're numbered sequentially so that you can actually follow the path of the eyes of the eye movement. So I've made, eye movements then are made up of uh, fixations which tend to last between uh, 0.1 and 0.5 seconds at a time before they move on to a different location. Uh, the, the bigger the circle in these graphics represents a longer, represents a longer fixation time. And then it saccades to the next fixation. So why is all of this important? You might rightly be asking. Well, there's a strong correlation between fixations and attention. We don't tend to look at things that haven't captured our attention. Um, you would most likely be alerted to movement in your periphery, but you can't see it in your periphery. So you look, you bring it into your foveal vision in order to see it. So why we look then, we look to see things more clearly. And also it's quite unnatural uh, to pay something attention in your periphery when it wouldn't just be easier to look. Coupled, of course, with the fact that it's quite blurry in your periphery. So that's why we look. And where we look is also driven by, by two factors. So that would be the properties of what we're looking at, okay? Which would be things like color. Um, movement would be another one. Perhaps placing something new in a familiar location would be something else. Um, and then our goals and our experiences and um, our expectations, are, you know, what we're trying to achieve during the task. So, for example, if I were to go onto Kalula's website and book a flight, then my eye tracking, my eye gaze data would be vastly different to somebody else who's never been on there. Because I'm familiar with the site. Uh, I live in Neisner, and I know what you're all thinking. It's hell on earth. It's, it, I have to fly regularly just to get out of there. Um, and, um, and I use the Kalula's website often to book flights, and so I know exactly where I'm going. Click, 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 done, check out. Whereas somebody who hasn't been on there, their eye movements would be vastly different because they're not familiar with the interface. So eye movements are task dependent, and here's another example. Uh, same packaging, obviously, 
on the left, you've got uh, the iGaze data down the side here as someone searching for whether or not this phone offers internet access. And on the right, uh, looking for the brand name of the phone, which is Samsung. Um, so depending on what you ask your respondent to do will also greatly influence the eye tracking data that you get back. And of course, whether or not they have experience with the interface before or not. So fixations correlate strongly then with attention and, and as, and as a, perhaps a room full of people who are interested in human behavior and their interactions with your uh, products and services, it's, it's being able to measure that attention objectively is really cool and also quite highly um, commercially valuable, you know. Now yesterday, uh, Dr. Schaefer, who I believe we're now renaming the old guy, <laughs> spoke a little bit about um, the barriers to, to some sort of acceptance of UX. So I'm just going to run through a, f a few of those. And this is not from my experience. This is just from my research that I've done. Um, so the, the results aren't always, uh, aren't always obvious. And the issues aren't always apparent at the time. And the value of, of UX research can be a little bit difficult to communicate. And it can't always be easily measured, unlike this enormous crocodile, which is four guys <laughs> doing that. It's actually just, I was interested, so I actually looked him up because I thought, bloody hell, that's a big croc. He was menace menacing a village in the Philippines, and he's 21 feet long, he weighs a ton. And uh, once they finally snagged him, it took a hundred people to pull him up onto the bank. And now he is 6,000 wallets. <laughs> no, he's not. They, they, they actually rehomed him in some attraction thing. He's a, he's a come and see the world's biggest croc kind of thing. Okay, so now there's wasting money and then there's in Candela, but research is expensive. Uh, and, you know, top management stakeholders, they are looking for a return on investment to justify the work that you do. And you've also got the challenge of educating and persuading those people who ho hold the purse strings to, you know, finance the work that you want them to. And eye tracking can help break down some of those barriers. Um, it's obje it, 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 it provides objective data, which is measurable. Um, so that's a key sort of feather in its cap. Uh, the, the value is a bit, can be sometimes a little bit easier to communicate, uh, especially when you've got complex eye tracking data that can be very beautifully and elegantly uh, displayed in, through a visualization like a heat map or something. It's just much more uh, readily understandable, perhaps, and also, being able to show a user's behavior rather than just talk about a user's behavior is also key. And all of this appeals to those people who have all the money. But it's not a tool that's to be used in isolation. Um, you can't use eye tracking to answer all questions. You can't, for example, uh, understand people's actions, the level of acceptance, their comprehension or, or their memory of, of looking at certain stimuli. That all still comes from your more traditional stuff like observation and, and, and interviews. And so uh, one area where it is valuable is, is that it can help to interpret some of that other stuff. So if there was a lack of performance in a specific test, it can perhaps be, it can help to be explained through looking at the eye tracking data. Oh, I didn't see it. Therefore, that explains why they didn't remember. Something that you might think would be obvious, uh, they can't necessarily verbalize the fact of whether they saw it or not. But the eye tracking data will, will tell you categorically whether it can. So there's a symbiotic relationship then between eye tracking and your traditional methods. And one helps to inform the other. Um, they looked, but did they understand? They looked. Um, but did they remember, they looked, but did they click? Or they didn't look and 
now we know why. When it comes to deciding whether you're going to do an eye tracking study or not, um, it tends to fall into two camps, those who think that you should eye track everything and those who don't think that the value is that great and you shouldn't bother. And it's probably somewhere in between. But there are three questions that would be useful for you to ask yourself before you begin considering to do an eye tracking study. Now, it's a mistake to just to say, I, I'm going to do an eye tracking study because I want to see where people are looking. Right? That's just too vague. It's not defined enough. So you need to have a very clearly defined research question. And you need to ask yourself, will doing an eye tracking study generate actionable insights that will uh, address your study objectives? Will, you know, if, <laughs> if it's not going to add any value by giving you some insights that you can then action, then what's the point? Eye tracking is good in detecting usability issues. Um, it can help reveal often unconscious processes that happen in between mouse clicks, mouse movements, or their, their uh, verbal feedback that they might give you. So for example, uh, let's say a respondent clicks on the link that you wanted them to click on, but they looked at two or three other links before they did. Now. Traditional methods like observation, you're unlikely to pick that up in observation. And in uh, interview, for example, they're not necessarily going to be able to recall that that's, the, that that's the process that they went through. They said, yeah, I found the link and I clicked on it. But eye tracking can actually reveal that there was some uh, an initial confusion. <coughs> and in addition to detecting, uh, eye tracking can also help explain uh, usability issues. So why did a participant uh, make a wrong selection? Uh, why did they take longer than expected to complete the task? Why did they not extract the information that we expected them to, to whilst doing the task? And it can also provide uh, quantitative insights as well. So you can do comparative studies. Uh, it can be internal, uh, it can be on a website, an advert, an element of a of, of a piece of work, you can do competitor analysis, and all of this will help inform your design design decisions, uh, uh, and help you to understand whether or not a product is ready for launch. So, if you get a no to question one, then you must just stop there and use another method, right? The second question would be. Uh, could we get this information by any other simpler means? Okay, do we have to do an eye tracking study to understand this? You know, why use a microscope uh, when a magnifying glass will do? And this is quite important because eye tracking can be costly and you waste a lot of money and a lot of time only to discover you've done an eye tracking study and you could have done something much simpler which would have given you the same answer. One area where it is good is to, uh, uh, to, to use eye tracking is when you're trying to understand attraction-related differences. So uh, which advert does the eye go to first? Or which home page creates the most interest, for example? You know, as I've mentioned, we're not always fully conscious of what attracts our attention. And we can't then verbalize after the event why we did what we did. And extracting that information through those other traditional methods is not as reliable as studying the eye gaze data. Now, the third question, well, the second and the third question is a, is a bit of an either and or kind of thing. You know, it doesn't have to be the simplest solution. Uh, if it's going to generate actionable insights and you need a bit of buy-in from top management, then eye tracking can be a good way to, to, to get top management on board because uh, it's visual proof and visual proof often is more powerful and objective than what people say or do. But just keep in mind question one and two when you're going for question three because if it transpires you do an eye tracking study and actionable insight not found through easier methods isn't delivered, then you might end up just disappointing. 
Anyway, you've asked those three questions, you've got the relevant answers, you've got the green light, okay? You're gonna do an eye tracking study, so um, the first thing you'll need is an eye tracker, which looks, well, like that. That's one version. We work with Toby. Um, they are the global leaders in eye tracking. They are a Swedish company based in Stockholm, and they, they dominate the market. They are, um, I mean, the, it's a growing industry and more people are coming into it, so they're facing more and more competition, but the reality is they are the best at it. Um, this is their X2 model, which is very accurate, very reliable, and, and quite flexible. You can use it in a variety of different ways. So you can use it with a, with a monitor up to 26 inches. You can also use it with a laptop if you want to just take it out into the field. You can also use with a, this is called a mobile device stand for testing tablets and smartphones. So the eye track eclipse in the bottom there, and then you've got this scene camera, they call it, which is basically a high definition web camera, recording what's happening on the device. And then the eye track is recording the eye gaze. And then in the software, the, um, it replays the video of the interaction with the device with the eye gaze data laid over the top. So you can see exactly where people are looking and how they're interacting with your mobile apps, your mobile websites and stuff. Then you have like your serious eye trackers, like this one, which is, this is called a T-series. It's a, this is your 300 frames a second. So you'd use this for reading studies, real scientific stuff. I don't think anyone in this room is gonna use this. Not, yeah, not to cause offense. I'm just saying you don't do reading studies, right? Um, these are all known as remote eye trackers. In other words, the person is sitting remotely from the eye tracker. Then you have wearable. And this is the latest and greatest in wearable eye tracking technology. Um, and uh, remote eye trackers are easier to use. The analysis is easier to do. But sometimes you just need a wearable eye tracker. If you're doing um, research in a, a real world environment, like a shop or a train station or an airport or a control room or an ATM, you need an eye tracker that you can wear. And the hardware is great, it's sophisticated, it's complex, but it's actually in the software where the real value is extracted. Uh, this is Toby Studio software, and it's like a complete end-to-end -end thing. It starts with the design uh, of your study, you do your data collection within the software, you can generate your visualizations, your heat maps, your gaze plots, and also you can extract your stats as well, all your data from it as well. We'll look at this in a little bit more detail in a second. Right, so we've got our equipment. Now we need people, we need eyes on. Um, and often people who are doing eye tracking studies or want to do eye tracking studies say, great, how many people do I need? 13. No, that's not true. There's, there's no one size fits all. It really does depend on the complexity of your study, whether it's a, a formative research study or a summative research study, and also the level of variance and accuracy that you can live with. Um, there is a book, I believe, not read it, but uh, Quantifying the User Experience, Practical Statistics for User Research. So if anyone really wants to know the answer and bore themselves to tears at the same time, that's a book that, that is recommended. Um, most of the time, though, it'll be time and it'll be budget constraints that dictate how many people you, you get on for your project. Well, they dictate the scale of the project. Okay, we're going to skip ahead in time, and we're going to assume that we've done a lot of the donkey work now, right? So we've, we've set up the lab, we've tested the equipment, we've run the pilot, uh, we've clearly defined our research question, we've prepared our stimuli, we've decided what our task's going to be, what our goals are going to be, um, we've recruited our respondents, we've calibrated every one of them, which doesn't take very long, by the way, but you still have to do it. We've done all our data collection, and we've done our pre and post interviews. So we've got like uh, all our data now and we're ready. So what does the, what does the, what does the result look like? What, what can we generate from the software? The gaze plots we've spoken about or you've seen on the previous ad. So this is good to show an individual's eye movements and it can be represented as an image or as a replay. I think we saw yesterday, uh, Dr. Schaefer showed us that video of the boobs, uh, the, the website and um, 
This is good to show an individual's eye gaze data, but it can't be aggregated. If you imagine you put two or three people's eye gaze over this, it just looks a mess. You can't really see what's going on. And then you get heat maps. I'm sure you guys have all seen heat maps. It's quite a common one. It's, it's a nice way to show eye gaze concentration um, as heat. Now, this is good for showing aggregated uh, eye gaze data. And there's other, uh, there's other ones as well, like clusters and opacity maps and bee swarms, but we're not going to go into all of those. Where the real value comes in is when you take your, your stimuli, be it an advert, a website, or I mean almost anything, whatever you've got on the screen, and you start to define your areas of interest. So you want to know, do they look at the message? Do they look at the image? Do they look at the ad? Do they look at the checkout button? Do they look at you know, what you want them to look at, basically? Um, and you just draw it on in the software. Um, and then from there, you can start to extract your data. The types of data that you work with in eye tracking would be things like this. So the box is your area of interest that you've defined, right? Let's say that's a key button on your website that you're really interested to know whether people can find, right? You want to establish, uh, a key one is time to first fixation. So from when the stimuli is presented, how long does it take the user to look at your area of interest? And obviously the faster that someone's able to find the thing that you want them to find, the better. Then you've got fixation duration. So they've looked at your area of interest. Now, how long do they spend looking at it? And the longer they spend looking at something, generally that would indicate something that they found to be of interest. Fixation count. So now you're not looking in terms of time, but how many fixations within that area. And a high fixation count would indicate that uh, your mental attention and memory are now engaged. So you've, you're actually really taking in whatever it is you're looking at. Observation count. So this would be where you look, you, you visit this area of interest, then you look away at something else, and then you come back. And if you see a lot of that, then that could indicate uh, confusion. And then the number of fixations before. So there are many, many other metrics. I mean, this is just, I don't know, there's like 30 different metrics that you can measure. This is just a few of them. So this would be, uh, this would be how many other things do they look at before they look at the thing that you want to look at. And all of these metrics will tell you something. They will, you, you will be able to draw conclusions from the user's behavior based on um, how you, you know, extracting the data and what you define to be an area of interest. The other thing with the Toby Studio is it does integrate with uh, other software. So Moray, I don't know, you guys use Moray, but there's a plugin for that so you can extract your eye gaze data and work on Moray. And then... Um, there's a separate piece of software called Biometric Software Suite, which enables you to synchronize your data with m your biometric data. So this would be things like EEG and ECG and EMG. This is where you're really getting quite technical in terms of understanding the emotion that sits behind a user's decision. But you can synchronize it with your eye tracking data, because all these things, you present the, the stimuli, and I go, well, that's a nice ad. But everything fires at a different rate. EEG, instant, and then you've got your galvanic skin response, you've got your eye gaze data, you've got your pupil dilation, and it all fires at different times. So this is useful if you want to synchronize it to be able to see what the emotion was at the time. But I don't know whether you guys are doing this kind of research. It's quite complex. Right, let's put all this together then. And uh, let's try and... I'm going to show you a case study now, where, uh, which was conducted by Toby, where we can kind of look at how eye tracking data might actually work in practice. So the case study uh, was, as I say, uh, conducted by Toby. The goal was to find information about a bond, okay, to take out for your house. You've got to go to the website, three renowned uh, banks in Spain, and 21 p participants doing the study. Right, case number one, this is their website, this is what they look like. Uh, looks green on the screen, but it's actually orange. Okay, so this is what they need to find. Hipotecas, uh, no, excuse my Spanish, I don't speak Spanish, uh, means mortgage, which to you guys means bond. Um, and uh, the, so this is the thing that they've been instructed to find. This would be your area of interest for, you know. So the stimuli is presented. Can you guys see that? 
the blue dot, that's the first fixation, okay? From there, they immediately scan down the left-hand side, trying to find the, the link. They can't find it, so they move up to the top menu, they move along, and then they click. So 18 seconds after the stimuli is presented, they click on the link. But from when they saw the link to clicking on it was only one second. So as soon as they found it, oh, there it is, job done. So the label clearly describes what they're looking for. There's no confusion. Happy. Bank number two. This really is a green site. Um, and now on the side here, they've got prestamost, which means loan. Right? So they've got it filed away under loans. You've got to go to loans, then you get to bonds. So the first fixation, just there. They do the opposite. They go to the top. They scan the top menu. No luck. They move over to the side. They come, they find the word that says loans. And then they they keep going because they're not 100% sure that that's what they're looking for. So they move down, check all the other options, then they move back up again. They go, okay, yeah, that is it. And then they, then they click. So 19 seconds to click after the page was presented, which is actually very similar to the first bank. But 14 of the 19 seconds were spent deciding whether or not that link was the right link or not. So there was a bit of confusion there. And now bank three. This is their site, blue and blue and red. Now they've got their bond information tucked away under particulars, which apparently means private, as in private banking. So you go to the private section where you can get all your information, including info about bonds. And their first fixation is there, and they look straight at it, right? That's the first thing they look at. Then they come across, then they go back across, then they come over to the sidebar, then they check out the ads, then they come over to the other ads and then back up to the top, and then <laughs> they come back over and they just do the whole site. Then they decide, okay, it's, it's, that's the only option, right? There's nothing else here for me, so I'm going with particulars. So it was 37 seconds uh, to... So this is the longest by quite some way, isn't it? Yeah. After entering the page, 37 seconds. But 36 seconds of that 37 seconds was deciding whether that was the right thing. And it's because the architecture wasn't immediately obvious. Uh, you know, the, you, the person had to realize, okay, I'm a, I'm, pri I'm a private individual, so therefore what I want is now filed away under private. And there's no other option for me. Um, so if we look at the, the total results then, this is now after they've um, seen the link. Okay, So they've seen the link, not from when the stimuli was presented, but from when they've actually seen the link. When you use the word hypothecus, which is actually loans, uh, not loans, that's no, uh, bond, right? The thing you're looking for, 1.6 seconds, immediately obvious. Loans, 6.25, and if you file it under private, 27 seconds. So there's some barriers there to the user experience. Um, you could ask, is it possible to extract that information through other means? And yes, it's definitely possible. Um, you're not going to pick that up through observation. But you're then relying on each and every participant to identify the source of their confusion, remember the source of their confusion, and then verbalize it to you afterwards, which is not always possible. And with eye tracking, we can see it in the data, we can see exactly what's happened. I mean, that's pretty unequivocal, right, what we just saw. So this is me just wrapping up. I just want to leave you with the message that the benefits really are that it's uh, measurable, right? It measures your user behavior objectively, which is an, a, a real benefit. The data can be communicated in a simple and elegant way. Um, if you've just done an eye tracking study and been giving a heat map, then, you, then whoever ran the study didn't do it right, but certainly they have their value. It's a tool that's to be used in conjunction with your other methods. As I mentioned, it's that symbiotic relationship between um, your existing methods and eye tracking and, that, and how they inform each other. Uh, and it adds value. 
you know, you can compare the objective data from the eye tracking with the subjective feedback that you get from the respondent. You can just draw a more holistic view of what's going on. And all that gives you, gives you great insight. So thank you. That's me. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm available. Or if you want to send me an email, you can do that too. If everyone, apparently we've got five minutes. Oh, there's one there. Okay. Uh, so just speak up. Yeah, outside voice. Okay. Um, my question is, just fine. I can't hear. Um, it's it's more on best practices, because I I mean, you've you've explained the the method and using and using the process and everything to to measure, but is there statistics? Um, around this, that's like previous or multiple tests has been conducted to to reveal best practices around, you know, um, where to place high value items on your screen, for instance, like calls to actions. But that, that you know, as a company, you don't have to actually go through the whole process yourself. So, it's so is there a way to? Can I just? I'll just summarise what you're saying. Is is there? A sort of a, a, a document or some resource then yeah. that you can just call on that would mean that you get all the learnings but don't have to do any of the eye tracking. Yeah. Is well, that right? Yeah, I mean, there's like a book about it or... or um, there are definitely, yes, you can, I mean, if you search online, you can always find uh, learnings that have come from eye tracking, definitely, uh, in terms of uh, how people engage with different things, uh, th whether they engage with the message or whether the image is... Uh, particularly relevant and all those kinds of things and how people navigate you know they 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 read in a uh, sort of like an f shape for example you know you tend to read the top quite extensively and then less and less so you sort of scan the remainder if you look at for example uh, a text when you're reading text on a website so there are definitely things that have come from uh, from eye tracking research that has been shared but also a lot of People, a lot of companies. I mean, it's it's a it's an expensive research, and they don't, they don't really want to share the findings. Uh, so I hope that helps a bit. Yeah. Well, you have a thing called what they call called virgin eyes, okay, which is not young people, that's people who haven't seen, uh, <laughs> they haven't seen the stimuli before, right, so it's the first time that they've seen it. So experience, as, uh, as I mentioned before, would play a role in, in the eye gaze data. You know, an existing client versus someone who has never used your website are going to reveal different uh, eye gaze data based on their abilities to, or, or their knowledge of the interface already. As to whether young people are, I mean, I'm sure you could do a study between young people and old people and discover that they're more adapted at navigating the user interface. But as to whether there is any sort of published findings on that, I'm not aware. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying what's well, taking so long? Well, it's, it would be an interesting study to do. It may well have been done, but I mean, I, you know, there's a lot of research going on, so I, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not personally aware of any. Yeah. Well, we're the resellers, so we represent Toby. So we sell the hardware, we sell the software, and it, and if and if a client doesn't want to buy the hardware and software, they just want to outsource the project, then we facilitate that as well. But but the. The analysis is done by Toby in Sweden, by their experts. We don't do that. Uh, we just facilitate the data collection, you know, which would be the respondents and um, actually putting the stimuli in front of the, uh, of the, the users and, and collecting that eye tracking data. Then we send it back to, to Sweden for them to do the analysis and then they, they would provide a report and send it to, uh, send it to the client. Now, uh, in terms of existing clients, it tends to be your bigger companies, so it's your banks primarily or financial services, uh, people who have the budget for this kind of UX research. Is that okay? Yeah. 
Sorry? It's a Windows only, I'm afraid. Uh, and we get that a lot. I know, I mean, I'm Mac, I'm presenting on a Mac. Is that mine, or have you swapped? Uh, uh, mine's somewhere over there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we all love our Apple products, don't we? And it's frustrating when we find something that's not compatible. Unfortunately, this is something that's not compatible. Okay. Okay. Uh, where am I looking? Okay, I think I've got it. Um, when I met you last year at the eye tracking conference, uh, you mentioned a book, eye tracking for the user research. I think that everybody would find a lot of value. Yeah, there's book. a lot of this in that. Yes, so I think maybe if if people come up, we could maybe just tell them about that book because it has a lot of user experience measures and stuff that you were speaking Sh about. Sure. Okay. Now that's perfect. Uh, I don't have the the. You know, I mean, it's it's there's a there's a book that I would recommend to anybody who's interested in using eye tracking in, uh, and it's just, uh, its title is Eye Tracking the User Experience, I think it is. I don't recall the name of the author, uh, but if you do a search for it, you will find a lot of this information uh, that I've just presented to you in there, along with a lot more detail in terms of how you would run a study and things that you need to be aware of. and Practical tips like how to set up your lab and how to get good data and how to interpret good data. So, Aga. Aga? Bojko. Which is A G A B O J K O, I think. Okay, right. Thank you, everyone.